Yeah. All right. Good morning. Good morning, and, and thank you for coming to the Town of Lexington's Planning Commission meeting. Uh, this is our normal monthly meeting, um, and it's being held at 8 a.m. at Town Hall. The meeting will air several times throughout the week. Uh, I am Keith Frost, your Planning Commission Chair, and I'll ask the other members to please introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Frank Berry. Good morning. Roscoe Kaufman. Good morning. I'm Lisa Gibson. Good morning, I'm Jeannie Michaels. Good morning, I'm Jamie Fight. Good morning, I'm Brooke Poole, Town Administrator. Good morning, Randy Edwards, Director of Transportation. Good morning, Johnny Miller, Parks and Sanitation, Assistant Director. Rosemary Newsom, Building and Planning. Good morning, I'm John Hanson, Director of Planning. Good morning, Charlie Thomas, Building Official. Hi, I'm Karen Hunter, the Assistant Municipal Clerk. All right, at this time I will ask uh, Commissioner Gibson if she will lead us in invocation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to serve you, to serve the town. I would just ask that you would give us wisdom and guidance in our preparation. We thank you for the Thanksgiving th season. And Lord, we thank you for those that serve and protect our lives who are away from their families during this time. We pray for those who have lost loved ones during this season. Pray that you would bless us and be with us in all that we do. In Christ's name, amen. 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 If you would, please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we'll call the meeting to order. Um, and first item of business is uh, our uh, meeting minutes from September 22nd, 2017. You received those in your packet. Do we have any corrections, omissions? Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, with, with the commissions, uh, without some objection, I think what we're going to do, given the, the room full of people here, uh, what I would like to do is move items five and uh, item five. Uh, up to the first item that we addressed this morning uh, so that we can uh, take care of that and let these folks have the rest of their day do what they want to if that's fine without objection all right hearing none we will start with item five of new business john good morning um your first item on the agenda this evening this uh, this morning Scotty and Susan Mill have requested to rezone 716 South Church Street from protected residential to neighborhood commercial. The request is being made to allow the property to be used by the Courage Center for a Youth and Family Center. Properties adjacent to this, to this one are zoned protected residential and protected residential two. Um, I think as you can see, there's a lot of interest with this request. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Mill are here to speak about what they're plans are for the property and I also have um, a petition that was submitted this morning as well as um, letters from two of the property owners or uh, property owners adjacent nearby or nearby.
I presented those to you, so it would be put in the permanent record. All right. People that sent them would know that they're included. With that, I'll turn it over to you to ask any questions of Mr. and Mrs. Mill. All right. Or yes, and I think that's probably the best place to, to start. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Mill, y'all want to come forward and, and just give us a, a five minute overview uh, of what you want to do, would like to do to the property? Uh, yeah, that'd be that'd great. Be great. We have some other speakers as well. Can Absolutely. You a yes, sir. Sure. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we're proposing a, a residential facility down there. We didn't want anybody to think that this thing was going to look clinical by any means or a doctor's office or an insane asylum. It is a family and youth counseling center for support. We're actually had been taken in by Mountain Moral Church last December as one of their ministries. Um, we are having family and kids meetings there. Uh, we're pretty much outgrowing our space. Uh, they've been, it's been a blessing that they've let us be part of their ministries, but the Monday night meetings and the, we feel like the youth uh, would be, be better suited to be in a little private <coughs> counseling center. Um, the folks from Mount Horror are here and uh, you know, we, we really think this will be great for this community, not only just Mount Warp Church now, Radius Church and all the churches along Main Street, Lexington. Um, it's nobody spends the night. It's 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Lights off. Kids can come and keep up with their studies. There's counseling. There's some recreation. I mean, that's basically what we want to do. Uh, we would, uh, uh, the, the property owner is here. I'm sure he would like to speak on our behalf, but um, you know this isn't some sort of doctor's office or a commercial facility. It's more of a residential community, council, community, as a, community center. It's a community center. Uh, our, our, our board of directors is real strong. Uh, Jay Coon serves on our board. Todd Atwater, Coach David Bennett. Uh, this is something we feel like the community really needs. Uh, we went through something year two years ago with our child, and we didn't have anything. We didn't know where to go, neither did he. So uh, anyway, that's that's my take. And it's it's a place for youth and families. We, we don't do treatment there. This is for recovery. So it's a place after they leave treatment. And that's where there's a huge gap. We're, we're there to fill the recovery gaps. Um, and it's a need that this community has. There's no other place, to my knowledge, like it in this community or in the state of South Carolina. Um, it, there's a saying, you know, you take a tree that's that's in poor health and it's in sick soil and you take it and you put it in healthy soil and it starts thriving and you move it and you put it back in that sick soil, well, what's it going to do? It's going to get sick again. And our youth and our families need healthy soil. And that's what we strive for the Courage Center to be. And this, this would be the perfect place for it. And, and Lexington could be a starship for that. And, and we, we want to be good neighbors, um, not only to the people that are there, but in the community. Um, so we just hope that you'll give us that opportunity. Okay. <clears throat> that, uh, actually, this is a friend of mine's, one of my best friend's property, and we've been talking about it for quite some time. And it's, it's his mother's, and he said, you know, she always wanted to do something for kids. So they're willing to sell us the land uh, at, at, at a very, very reasonable cost. We have the, uh, we'll have the finances in place the first of the year. Um, we're just asking for your consideration. All right. What, uh, what discussions have you had with your adjacent property owners? Um, we went and knocked on some doors Monday. We were um, only able to meet with two of them. Um, mm -hmm. The others were not home. So okay. um, we're attempting that process um, because we want them to know what we're doing. We don't want to try and do anything we're, we're proud of what we're doing sure. um, it's a family issue it's a community issue it doesn't I would be very surprised if there's not anybody in this room that um, that the opioid and um, addiction has not affected their families whether it's not a family member a co-worker a relative it's affected us all and um, it's a family family and community problem. Um, and for every dollar that we spend on recovery, it saves five to seven dollars in public safety and health care cost. So this is huge. 
This is another way that we can solve this problem. And we need to come alongside these folks. Okay. Uh, yes. Other than it, that's your friend's um, you know, land that you're getting a deal with, is there another major reason that this exact place is the place? It's, is there so many other places that this it's could a be? It's beautiful piece of property. It's conveniently located. It's centrally located. Um, like I said, we can, we'll be helping not only the folks going at Mount Horror, but all the other churches and all the other schools in the area. And there's nowhere around Mount Horror that no, it might be? No, not, not with this type of privacy. And, uh, it's beautiful. How many people do y'all expect to be there at one any given time? 20, 25 at the most. Is that throughout the day or is that at That's it. Once we'll have scheduled, I think our Norton, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we'll have scheduled counseling meetings and then people can come during the day. As support groups. Us for support. Are they, do they drive themselves there, or are they yes. dropped off, or both? Or? Both. Yes, yeah, some cannot drive due to the circumstances. And is there any given time of the day that's the busiest, or? No. Well, right now we have our meetings on in the evenings. We don't have an answer to that question right now because <clears throat> we're meeting at the church and our meetings are at night. Ideally, we would like to be open during the day because there's some of these children that are not allowed to go back to school um, and that's key for us we would like to have for them to have a place to go so they're not at home isolated um, because that's when relapses um, we have uh, over 20 volunteers risk. at this point and so one of our goals is to keep help the kids to keep up with their studies so we would have computers or work on the GED now you say kids what, what are the ages of these kids 15 to 26 is our target as well as the families. Um, Development-wise, the property, how much of the property do you intend to, to develop? I mean, I, we've got kind of a sketch plan here, but I, it shows, yeah, really just shows a small piece. We've got some renderings, if y'all would like to see them. Okay. This, is, uh, this is actually what it would look like in there. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's not a metal building. It doesn't look like a doctor's office. Uh, I'll put these up here for people to look at. And we actually are coming off of South Church back in here with tremendous setbacks off of all of the adjacent property owners. What are the setbacks? Uh, okay. Scott, our architects here, 125. Yeah. So that's so that's a, a difference between this this sketch plan that we have and yes, our package. Yes, we just okay. started. To, well, he's he's helped us with this, but he's walked the site. We determined that. And, and I talked to the other civil engineer that we can tuck it back in the woods. And I'm a, I'm a fire sprinkler contractor. We're going to put a sprinkler system in it. Um, it'll, it'll be a safe place. And it, it, it'll have a residential look. Okay. Is there any plan for any fencing? No, sir. Around the? No, sir. One driveway in and parking. Um, not, no, <clears throat> no, not a big sign or anything in front. Just an address. All right. Um, anyone else you would like to, to have speak before we get well, into the, the general the public? The landowner, if he so would. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Damon Walker. I represent my mother, Esther Walker. Um, this piece of property is, I think we've owned this property 20 something years, 20 plus years. When my father bought it, I don't think there was any contractual restrictions associated with it. It was a uh, investment piece in his mind. Uh, and it's basically just been sitting there uh, for a number of years. I've been knowing Scotty and Susan quite a while. They have, uh, they're very benevolent. They uh, do a lot with childhood cancer. And uh, one day we were talking and he was talking about, I knew Susan was doing something with the uh, drug advocacy type programs. And uh, he asked me if we had any property for sale. And uh, I guess it's the timing of it, but uh, I am currently liquidating all my mothers commercial property in Lexington, Georgia, all over. Uh, this property is going to be sold, whether it's sold to him or to uh, a developer. Um, she's at an age, she's ready to get rid of most of her estate. Um, but 
my family has always been a, uh, a participant in children's programs. We donated uh, property for uh, the Dickerson Center. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with that. Uh, child advocacy uh, group that helps uh, abuse children. I uh, done a lot of work with orphanages and stuff. And uh, this would just be one more piece that uh, we would like to see come into the community. Um, I know a lot of people don't know Scotty. I know him very well. You're not going to get a piece of junk. You're not going to get uh, abandoned as far as uh, the upkeep of it. Uh, I think it'll be an asset to the community. Uh, I don't think we're talking about, at least from my knowledge of what they're planning on doing, we're not talking about importing children in. These are our children. These, this is our community that's in this plight, so to speak. Uh, I'd love for see it to come in, but uh, uh, over the past 20 years, especially in the last five years, we've been approached probably 15 different times by developers wanting to buy this property, put some form of track homes in. I guess that's probably what would, it would be best utilized for, or it has a sewer line in it. So uh, that's probably what's going to happen. I'm not here to try to threaten anybody or push anybody one way or the other, but we're liquidating the property. I doubt a single family resident will buy 17 acres in the middle of the town and put a home on it. So that's probably what's coming here. Um, and I, you know, that's all I wanted to do was just kind of let y'all know what my family's fixing to do. If it doesn't go through for the meals, it, it will go on the market with all the rest of her stuff. All right. Thank so you. This, mm -hmm. go ahead. this property is um, what they're building is three acres, but it's a total of 17. Yes, ma'am. In the whole. Right. So the rest would be left to be sold to Yeah, we, we, uh, my father originally bought the property uh, for $230,000, I think it was. Not to be sold. Okay, so. The plans for the rest of it, we, we, we deed restricted for a conservation. Oh, you need to stand. Sorry. Sorry. Come, 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 come to the microphone, please. Yeah. Scotty, come up here to the microphone <laughs> so we can hear you. <laughs> Folk, the folks at home, the, the, that's right, the folks at home want to hear you. We, we have no plans of selling any, any of that property. It'll either be put in a conservation easement or deed restricted so nothing else can go in there. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Scotty, with the plan that you just showed us is down in front, what is the setbacks, I guess, from the, the building to the adjacent property line? At a minimum of 100, what did you say, Scotty? 125, a minimum 125 feet. All right. Is there anyone else, uh, Mr. Mill, that you want to speak on behalf of the project? Uh, yes, Daryl Hudson, please. Okay. Mr. Hudson, good to see you. Good morning. I didn't plan to speak, but you got <laughs> something really close to my heart. For the people, I don't know if somebody's opposing or not, for the people that don't, don't know the Mills family, they've been giving their whole life. And uh, I won't go through the litany of things they've been giving, but I can tell you some facts that you need to know. Number one, that there's eight people more died in Lexington County from opiate abuse than car wrecks so far this year. You think about that. And they're not on the front page of the newspaper because of the stigma about what's going on in our community. And it's a worldwide problem. You say, well, I don't know an opiate abuser. I am one. I'm your county councilman for this district and I got hooked on opiates in 2008 through doctors. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to your brother, it can happen to your sister, and it happened to me. Now luckily I was raised a loving family that we all got together and we worked this thing out. And I'm more determined than ever to help our children. What better can you do than help somebody who can't help themselves? Your building permit setbacks in our county are what, 20 feet, 10 feet? But we're gonna say 160 is not okay. We're gonna let track housing come in, that's not a threat. I can assure you I am fighting track housing in Lexington County as hard as I can get because I can share from you firsthand experience the value of your houses around it will go down. Track housing was put behind my house I built my house 17 years ago. And because of circumstances, not be all because of y'all, I put four kids through college. I planned for three. 
So I had to borrow money on my house. And when they went to borrow money on my house this year, they finished putting my son through college, my house depreciated $32 a square foot. So if your neighbors want to put track housing in them, that's their decision. Let's do something to help our youth. They have nowhere to go. And, and Susan was correct. When you have a sick family member, everybody's sick. And people have got to change people, places, and things to get well. This is a place for them to escape from the peer pressure of their school, the peer pressure from their friends, to find people that are struggling with the same battles that I went through. And I can assure you of this. They say, why is opiate so rampant? I broke my neck in 2008 playing golf, the very thing that I love to do. I detached my bicep from my shoulder and broke my neck in four places. They put a steel rod, a titanium rod, screws and cadavers in my neck. I run two businesses. I don't have workman's comp. I don't get paid unless I make money. So I didn't have one choice. It was to go to work. And I worked every day in tremendous pain. I went to as many doctors as I could get to get as many opiates as I could get to make the pain go away to provide for my family. So how does heroin fit in there? Heroin is the exact same thing as the opiates. It creates the same euphoria. And it's almost impossible to get off without help. If they told you to eat a ketchup bottle and the pain would go away, you would do it. So closing, finally, for those people that are so concerned about their neighbors. Our zoning laws have not been rewritten since December 9th of 1986 in our council. It's ridiculous. So I cannot stop zoning on that piece of property fast enough to stop what's going to go in there. You want to get an idea of what's going to go in in there? Right down Cole, Old Chapin Road right now. And Mr. Mungo is doing exactly what he's supposed to do. He's following directions. You can't blame him because we're the one that gave him directions. They're putting 216 homes on that property and they're 10 feet apart. We already have a traffic problem in Lexington. So the last thing I'll share with you, our zoning ordinance in this town or in Lexington is 12 houses per acre. Now, I'm not real smart, but it gets 17 acres times 12 houses times four cars, and that's what you want to deal with. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. And just a couple of items, Councilman. We, we did revise our town ordinance for zoning ordinance in 2007, I think, and added a, a, a significant number of zoning uh, classifications just to avoid some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, so, for the town, yeah, not for the county, but for the town. So, um, anyone else? Uh, yes, Mr. Coach David. Okay. And then Julie, if that's okay. I'll okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Coach David Bennett, uh, Lexington District One Athletic Director, and through all my years of teaching and coaching, and now I get to be in all the schools. You know, all five high schools, seven middle schools, and seventeen elementary schools. And we're growing. We're 26,000 kids in our school district. We're going to 40,000 by 2030. I had to get tutored in math in high school. I wasn't the brightest guy. But if that's 13,000 kids, 14,000 more kids in 13 years, we're growing over 1,000 a year. I'm very honored to serve on the board for the Courage Center. And we've hired a phenomenal executive director and Julie who worked for the state and if I was a neighbor around that I'd be shouting please let this happen rather than a bunch of homes come in there because this is going to be an awesome place for our children and it can happen in any family <coughs> any family with marijuana or cocaine or opium anything that can happen in any family alcohol and drugs so I think this is a blessing for our community 
and I think we ought to be jumping for joy and embracing. It. It's an honor to serve and help. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm a little nervous. You'll have to bear with me. That's all right. I used to do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get my. Um, so I'm Julie Cole. I am the executive director of the Courage Center. I'm um, also a person in long-term recovery. And for me, what that means is that I haven't had alcohol or other drugs since July of 1998. Um, I think it's really important to lead with because um, I'm a product of youth recovery. So um, this is something that mm -mm, means a lot to me because it was something that I needed. Um, my recovery was really fits and starts because it was just um, people who happened to just come along the way to offer me support. So um, what we know about young people, especially adolescents um, and young adults, um, is that uh, their recovery for a young person doesn't look the same as it does for an adult. Their, um, the support needs to be targeted, it needs to be consistent, and it needs to be multifactorial, meaning um, you need to have a lot of different things. You need to have support <clears throat> systems in place, um, accountability, you need to offer them leadership opportunities, um, and also recreational um, opportunities so they learn how to live life sober um, and do activities sober. And so when we talk about recovery support, what we're talking about is people who are, are motivated to be in recovery and, and um, motivated to initiate and sustain recovery. And so we're not talking about folks who are being court ordered to a treatment center who are, um, who are uh, resistant to the process. We're talking about people who are voluntarily coming for recovery support. Another thing that we offer is there are very few organizations, actually only one other one that we know of in the state that offers family recovery services. Um, most of the time, family services are an adjunct to an identified person in a clinical level service. So they, they get to come along with a person who's going to treatment. Um, but family services, targeted family services, are um, few and far between. And so that's also something we know if the family is involved, with a young person, their chance of sustaining recovery is 80% higher. So we're talking about people who are in our community, but also people who also um, we're creating um, an environment that supports and almost um, helps, um, I don't want to say guarantee, but supports recovery for young people in our area. Um, right now, we just don't have anything like that. Um, so. What I look like now in comparison to then, or I'll even say what I look like when I was six months in recovery compared to six months before I found recovery, um, is that I was going on four and five day um, alcohol and al cocaine binges. I was um, disappearing to different states and losing cars and ending up with people I didn't know, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. Six months into recovery, I was in school, stable in school. I finished three degrees in recovery. Um, I was stable in a job and paying my own bills, and I had started to restore relationships with my family. So it took two years for my parents to give me a key to their house, but six months in, that relationship was being repaired. So I was a drain on the community, not only community resources, but I was a danger to the community. And in recovery, I was not a danger to, to the community, and I haven't been since I sustained recovery. And that's what we're looking to help is people in our community who are drained on these this community's resources who are danger to the members of our community offering them a place so that they can become vital um, contributing members of our community because they're in the community either way it's just a matter of what we offer them so that they can have that opportunity um, so thank you for your time thank you for listening to us this morning and I'm available to answer any questions anybody should have okay and I, I do have sure. I do have one question um, <laughs> tell me about your funding how sure. you guys are set up right now um, we are supported by Mount Aurora partially um, a lot of the what we have support wise is in kind and then we have private fundraising we're also working on um, uh, some opportunities with a couple of uh, community foundations, including Central, um, Central Carolina Community Foundation and the Lexington Medical Center Foundation. But if we are able to um, do everything we need to do, we'll start a, um, a full-blown capital camp, uh, fundraising campaign. Okay. All right. Any other questions from Ms. Cole? All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. Um, is that it, uh, Mr. Mill? Mr. Representative Atwater, do you, you want to speak to us? You're good. All right. Thank you for being here. Okay.
Uh, just uh, one more, please. Okay. It's uh, Nick Cunningham from the church. They didn't sign that paper. Right? No, sir. Pastor Nick, come on forward. This is the first time. First time in front of a microphone? No. <laughs> first, we're first time sitting on that side. <laughs> yeah. We're used to sitting on that side. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I, I think we're all here because we we want our community to be great. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. We all care. We all want Lexington to be uh, the greatest community that, that it could possibly be. And I, I'd really like to ask what, what makes a community great. You know, what is that? We're uh, coming up to the holidays. We're going to be watching our favorite holiday movies soon. Am I right? Some of you probably like Christmas Vacation. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But perhaps, you know, the most beloved holiday film is It's a Wonderful Life. Anybody want to argue with me on that? <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life. You know, and I, and I say that the end of that movie always moves me. And it's a reminder of what really makes a community great. It's people coming around people. You know, it's what makes community great is way more than property values. Um, it's way more than, than having our, our nice, safe neighborhoods. It's people willing, willing to come around other people who are struggling. You know, and, and that's really what this is about. That's, that's the heart behind this. Um, it, is, it is a major problem, and the reality is we are an affluent community. We have the money to cover it up, but it's there. It's there, and it's affecting a whole lot of families. And uh, the, the location is centrally located. Um, you know, we, we have been a sponsor as a church, but make, make a mistake, the church is bigger than Mount Horror. You know, the church is made up of all the people who, who follow Jesus. We believe this can be an asset to all of them and, and helping uh, to, to really point their, their children in, in a positive direction. So thank you for your time. Um, we, we love working with them, and we, and we love the future and where, where this is headed. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, John, you have, uh, I guess we have a sign-up sheet going around. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through and uh, down the folks that have signed up to speak. Uh, what I would ask you to do, given the number of folks that we have here this morning, um, if you would please limit your comments to three to five minutes. If you have a group of folks here in the same neighborhood that are sharing the same concerns, we would appreciate it if you would elect a speaker so that we don't have the same comments uh, repeated uh, numerous times uh, just in the, in the sake of time this morning. So um, with that, whenever, whenever we get done, John, we can start with uh, whoever has signed up to speak. I fear the message may have not have gotten back to the to the to the audience. It, you only had to sign up if you were planning to speak. So I may call some people's <laughs> okay. names. Oh, uh, okay. And so I guess what we will do then, I will, what I will do is I will ask: Is there anyone here who would like to come forward and speak? Please, sir, come forward. If you would, please introduce yourself and let us know where you live um, within the town, sure. um, and then provide us mm -hmm. your comments. My name is Tyler Pittman. I live at 712 South Church Street, so I'm just around the corner here. Um, I think I can keep it to under three minutes, in fact. Okay. Uh, over the last two days, I've been speaking with a lot of my neighbors, and I think that I speak for all of them. If I don't, please correct me. Uh, in saying that we don't want to keep anyone battling with addiction from getting help. That's not our goal. Our goal is simply to maintain our property value. That's our one concern. I don't believe that we should accept the inevitability of a um, company like Mungo in our community. I don't think that that should be, even if it's not intended as a threat, it, it, I mean, it feels that way. I don't think that we should accept their progress as inevitable. Um, I went around uh, with a petition as well. I don't know if that was supposed to be submitted before this morning. If not, I, you know, I have it now. Okay. Um, I got 29 signatures. 23 of the 29 signatures are adjacent property owners. And we all had the same message. Every time I opened a new door or a new door was open to me, the same thing was told to me. Essentially, we want people to get help, but we don't think that this section of our residential you know, community is the right place for it. Okay. And if you've got uh, a petition, if you can hand it to John so that he can make sure it gets in the record, that'd be great. You can just, yeah, no, I, no, uh, I didn't sign the petition, right. and I'd like to sign it. That's his. <laughs> uh, all right. That's really all I have. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right. Next. Is there someone else who would like to speak? Like to speak. Yes, sir. <coughs> Please come forward, introduce yourself, and tell us where you live. Uh, my name is Fabio Molano, and I do not live in the property, but 
I bought the property on 716 South Church Street about seven years ago. Um, I do love this country uh, to the point that I buy this property with the only purpose of saving the house. Because the person that owned it before said that he wanted to knock down the house and build a new one. So this house was built in 1941. When I come here to the United States, I was basically starving in Colombia, South America. I was taking a dumpster for food. And so I figured that by me buying this house, I will give back to the United States, to the heritage of the so many people that owe so much for me. I don't want the house knocking down. I want the house to remain and look exactly the same it looked in 1941. Where I'm going with this? I've been in this country since 1979, and I have lived the life that is lived here in the United States for the last 42 years. I have become a business owner and a successful contractor. I advise international construction magazines, and um, I have been a school teacher also in Lexington High School. And I think because of the way I have lived uh, in an in a orderly manner in my life, and I have seen how others don't, you know, that um, when you move a setup like this into a neighborhood like that one, it's always a chance for disruption. My 1941 house, and I, I didn't get together with nobody here, I don't know nobody, I'm not against nobody, I don't have no friends in here or enemies in here, as far as I know, and I hope I don't gain any. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, that house will be vandalized, but any of those kids or persons, if not one, it be more than one, because of the way that I have lived in this country for 40 years, I know that once people is addicted to drugs, it will be other problems adjacent to those drugs. And one of them is vandalism and other crimes. In my house, if anyone in here can guarantee me that any of those people that is gonna move into this, or is gonna be going into this suggested business, if anyone of you can guarantee me the house is not gonna have a broken window, or that somebody's not gonna go in, the, because the house stays empty. That house will never be occupied nobody as long as I live. And then I'm planning to make it probably donation to the county as a, some kind of museum or something. But if somebody in this place can guarantee me that that house is not gonna be vandalized by any of these activities in here, I'm all for that. But in the meantime, I think we all need to think about not only me, but everybody in the society in this, in this area, that the consequences, so far everybody talks in here, all the pros and all the pros, but nobody look at my face and say, this is what I'm gonna do for you as an owner, and say, this is, this is the- this Mr. Is the, Marina, please, the please speak stuff. to the commission. Yes, sir. This please is the good up. stuff that I'm gonna do for you, and this is what, how we're gonna prevent crime, and this is what we're expecting, but this is gonna happen, and this is what we're gonna solve it. They say it's gonna be all nice and beautiful, but who's gonna guarantee that? Who's, you, you know, and I know it's no warranties in life, but my personal view is that it will be more promised with this that it's gonna be, and I'm not doing it for me because I don't live in that house. I'm doing it for the community. I'm doing it for a house that I think it has some kind of historical value, and I think it's gonna be problems there if, 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 if this thing goes through. Okay, thank you very much. All right, anyone else wish to speak? Yes, sir, please come forward. I might be just as nervous as Julie was up here. Uh, <laughs> And I appreciate you guys giving me an opportunity to speak. My name is Brock Sansbury. Uh, I am a person in long-term recovery as well. And uh, just like Julie stated before, what that means is I haven't had the opportunity or desire to use drugs or alcohol since October 24th of 2013. Um, you know, I'm an Irmo resident, <laughs> so, um, but I, my family has been in Lexington a long time. Um, they're business owners here in Lexington, and so uh, half of my life has been in Lexington. Um, you know. The first thing that comes to my mind is people who struggle with addiction aren't bad people doing bad things. They're sick people who need to get better. Um, there are tons of resources for veterans, for um, victims of abuse, for homelessness, for poverty, and no one bats an eye. Anytime we want to talk about this subject, it gets uh, 
pretty ramped up. And obviously, you know, rightfully so sometimes. It's a very touchy subject for a lot of people, but like someone touched on earlier, addiction doesn't just touch me now. It touches everyone in this room and it affects a lot of different people. And the one thing, the cool thing that the Courage Center is doing is providing resources for families. You know, um, my grandfather sent me to a treatment center in Florida, didn't even send me to a treatment center in my hometown of South Carolina. Sent me to a treatment center in Florida only for me to come back and for him to ask me, how long do I have to do this recovery thing? Um, which again, just um, is the epitome of the disconnect in terms of societal standards of what I'm supposed to do as a member of the recovery community versus what normal people do in society. I'm a taxpayer. Um, I'm, a, I'm about to be a graduate of the University of South Carolina uh, with honors. I'll be going to the Darla Moore School of Business for graduate school. Um, I am too a product of youth recovery. Um, and what a place like this could do is, is astronomical uh, to what it can't do without it. Um, so again, you know, we have to, um, as a society, as a community, if we are contempt prior upon investigation, we're in a world of trouble and we really need to come together. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you very much. All right. Anyone else that wishes to speak? Yes, ma'am. Please come forward. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Shannon Hicks. I am a mother. I'm a recovery coach. Um, and I have a son in long-term recovery. I also was a constituent of the town of Lexington until three years ago. Um, the reason I moved was because of the drugs in my neighborhood. I was neighbors with Todd Carnes, who's on town council. <laughs> my son was getting drugs three houses away. I walked in and grabbed him by his ear, told the father off, called the police, and nothing happened. <laughs> I had nowhere to go. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't have the re a recovery center. I didn't have the courage center. The only time I was educated was when my son was in treatment and my insurance was paying tens of thousands of dollars. The reason the courage center is so important to me is because I go every week as a parent. I learn. There are more parents there than children because we're the ones that want to get out of chaos the most. <laughs> we're not bothering anybody. We just, we just need help. And I understand the concerns of the constituents. I totally do. Goodness, I moved in the four acres and I thought, I have a great neighbor. It is an elementary school. Their retention pond floods my yard every time it rains. <laughs> We had to get a new septic tank. I had to spend $20,000 on landscaping. It's been crazy. I guess what I'm trying to say is I wanted to give a different perspective. This isn't a place where all these kids are sitting around just stoned out of their mind thinking about breaking into the neighbor's homes. This is a place where we go because we need help. And it's a positive place, and it's a place of hope, and it's a place of love. And to be honest, it's a place without stigma. We need a place, us parents, we need a place to go and talk to someone and feel like somebody's listening, somebody cares, and somebody can give us an, some really good advice to help us get out of the cycle of addiction and chaos in our homes. And that's all I have to okay. say. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to apologize to everyone here this morning. I feel like my family and I are responsible for this whole carrying on. And you are? Don Bruner. Okay, thank you. My father bought the property in 1941 for $3,750. That was almost 20 acres, three barns, a tenant house, and two kids at that time. He had one more a little bit later on. We decided we wouldn't pinch his head off because <laughs> Roscoe knows him real well. <laughs> but anyway, if we hadn't sold the property and my father still owned it, and he would be, I'd have to think how many years old now, 115, he wouldn't sell it. And I think the people on South Church Street that are property owners have got no problem with the facility that you folks are proposing. We think that's a wonderful idea. Don't get us wrong. We don't want to be against that thing because it's, it's very much needed and we understand that. But 
South Church Street is not the place for. You need to find someplace else. They can't convince me that, that our property values aren't going to go down some. And we don't need any more traffic on South Church Street. I remember when South Church Street wasn't even a paved road. So, I mean, I, I wish we could all come together and agree on this thing, but I, I just I can't see putting this type of facility on South Church Street. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, my name is Robin Jones. I'm the director of Hope Academy Recovery High School, which will be the first high school in South Carolina that is designated for high school students in recovery. Um, the, I, I really applaud that people are showing up and sharing their opinions. I think that's how American government works, of course. Um, and I could tell you a story about my own recovery, um, but I think that we all, especially at this season, we all celebrate and hope that everyone has a life that is successful. Um, instead, what I'd like to share with you are some statistics. And for those of you in the community, um, there are, of course, so many students that are young that are suffering with drug abuse and um, addiction and alcoholism. Um, the fact of the matter is this world is changing and we no longer live in, um, times of the 1940s and 1950s. Um, in Lexington and Richland County alone, um, last in 2015 fiscal year, Deotis reported 53 students who were from zero to 11 years of age who were referred for help. In 2016, there were 608 students zero to 11 who were referred to Laredoc and Lexington and Richland counties alone. That is a 294% increase in students who have been identified as having substance use issues. Um, we are going to pay for those students one way or another. It cost $80,000 to incarcerate a youth in the state of South Carolina. Um, recovery in communities is more <coughs> sustainable than it is if they go elsewhere and may or may not return to this community. If the facility is located in a residential section, those students are, um, because they're in that environment, it's more likely that they'll be successful in their recovery. Um, they need to be in an environment where they come from, and 78% of the students come from upper middle class families. This is not a problem anymore that happens on Skid Row. And I know that we all like to have the idea that someone who suffers with addiction and alcoholism is a person who you know, is sitting under a bridge and homeless, but that's not what it looks like. The average age of opioid overdose is 15.7. That's CDC. Um, these are not people who are 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. These are kids. Um, and we are going to pay for them one way or another. They're going to vandalize and break into cars that they're using because they're looking for money to help themselves and they don't know how else to get it because they're kids and they don't have a job anyway. If they're in recovery, the chances of that happening are so much slimmer <laughs> So I can't assure you or anybody else of anything, but I can assure you that if we don't do something to help them, that the problems are going to be much bigger. So it actually will not only help property value, but it will help the crime go down um, because you know 80 something percent of crimes are committed because of or related to drug use. Um, so as we help young people change their lives at that stage, they're going to be less of a burden on the community later, and they're going to be less on, of a burden on the community right now. Um, those kids are bored. They don't have anything to do. So by providing them with a structured center, they, 
they not only have something to do, but they're around other peers who are positive and want to do something different with their lives. The Courage Center is offering family support so that the parents can learn how to better support those students and their chance of recovery is so much higher. Um, so it's gonna improve property value. Um, and it's very likely that no one will know that it's there anyway. And as far as traffic goes, that's what scheduling is for. Um, as we've done research with Hope Academy, we've realized that we have to open a little bit later. So instead of having school start at 8.30 for our students, we will start at 9.30 and 10 o'clock um, so that it's staggered and so that traffic isn't a problem. So those issues can be handled very easily. Those are not issues that are worth standing in the way of improving the community by offering a sustainable recovery center. Where Thank is Hope Academy going to be? Hope where, Academy, where we have not, um, we're opening in 2019. Mm -hmm. We haven't established a firm location yet. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually looking in Lexington because the numbers are over here. This is where the drug problem is. It's, it's not somewhere else. It's not in another <clears throat> community. It's right here under your noses. And people don't talk about it because of the stigma. They don't want their children to be labeled as drug addicts and have more trouble. They don't, you know, I am in recovery and I, I got into recovery when I was 23 and I was raised in Lexington. I was in Springdale. I went to Springdale Elementary. I went to Fulmer Middle School. I went to Airport High School. Um, and my mother didn't want anyone to know. And so I went away to treatment. And um, what I know now, I'm a school teacher. I'm successful. I own property. Um, recovering addicts and alcoholics don't look the way that you think they look. Um, we're very successful people once we're in recovery. But when I was bored, I mean, I was up to all sorts of shenanigans. So, you know, the option is allow the shenanigans to happen or offer a place where there's support so that students can change the way they view the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think Thank that's you. it. Thank you. All right. Anyone else wish to speak? Yes, sir. My name is Nathan Keller and I'm actually a volunteer with the Courage Center. Uh, I met Susan at the, uh, the Governor's Summit here in Columbia and um, my, my regular job is I actually work for Paragon Healthcare. I do a tremendous amount of work with Lexington Medical Center and various hospitals throughout the area in combating this. I'm also a person and individual who is in long-term recovery as well. But I hear, you know, the thing that's interesting is, is we hear about the, the epidemic and, and here we have an opportunity to actually do something that isn't being done. And then I look at it, you know, I, I understand the concerns that I hear from a real estate perspective, but like if I hear about traffic, if traffic's an issue, well, if we look from a development perspective and the size of that property and the potential of what future opportunities could do, I think when you look at what the traffic that this would bring as opposed to anything else that you would put there, um, this is a better option if you want a less flow of traffic. As well as we're looking at, at recovery as an opportunity and I can tell you the reason why I volunteer my time and the reason I come here is because when I was a teenager, there was no place for, for, for me to go. There wasn't something like that. And so when you can just visualize in your mind what a, a 17 year old or a 16 year old who's trying not to do this, what that person looks like and the condition of that individual is a lot different than a kid who is in active addiction uh, breaking in and, and participating in that behavior. So the landscape looks a little bit different. And so I have to think, you know, you, you get the concept of NIMBY. You know, it's like, yeah, we need to do something, but not in my backyard. But I think a lot of that comes from the contempt prior to investigating what really is going on. When you look at, at the rendering of, of that program and what's going on with families who are broken and they're ashamed and they're scared and they really don't want to talk about it or be open and, and a child who's suffering and they're looking for something 
and they're starting to, to kind of find their way out of that. What that landscape looks like, it's a very closed and private setting. So it's not something that is gonna be out with balloons and, and you know signs and flashing lights. This is something where people can come in a very closed environment to receive help. And so when you look at that, what that brings to your neighborhood is you can, in a very quiet and respectful manner, affect change. One person at a time, one family at a time. Or the, the flip side to that is we come here for, for this today, and say you get shot down, and then you come in three months from now and you got you know, something that's completely different from the sheer size of that land value, no matter what. The development perspective, the numbers game, as well as I think when I look at what that new construction would look like and what it does, I think from a real estate perspective, your property value would, would appreciate in time. So I'm looking at realistic pros trying to explain realistically what that looks like. There's not 50 people all at one time. There may be an hour or so where families come in, but it's a very responsible uh private closed setting for people to come and really find a way out and I'm gonna tell you the one thing is is as a community this is our opportunity to come together and actually affect something for the positive for the good that can lay the groundwork for other communities there's a tremendous need but I can tell you I couldn't see a better plan that's laid out I couldn't look at a, a better function especially when I look at setbacks if I were a residential owner of 150 feet. Um, this is gonna be kind of out of sight, out of mind. One road in, one road out. So whenever I look at what I'm being presented with as opposed to what the potential of the future could be presented, all the problems that I look at of traffic and of people and you know, whenever I'm looking at stick building and all of these things that potentially could have, my argument right here, this is really a, a tremendous option with with an opportunity to say hey I supported that and I, I had a vote to really affect change for my community and lay the groundwork for others to follow and I know Scotty and Susan I've known Julie for over a decade um, I wouldn't I wouldn't volunteer my time to come and do this and I can tell you as an individual that, that really has a, a spot in this, there's nothing better when you can actually sit down with some, some youth who are looking for a way out and you can provide that for them in a nice, safe, quiet setting. So uh, I just, uh, I hope that that, that, uh, that that shed a little light for us and uh, I would really like to see this come to fruition. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much and, and I'm gonna, I'm going to take a moment here just, just for a second. Um, there were a couple of points you made there that I think uh, are hitting home as I sit here this morning. Um, first of all, I want to make sure that, that everyone in this room and everyone watching understands that this discussion this morning is not a referendum on the mills and what they're doing. I think what they are doing is an absolute vital service to this community. And it somewhat disappoints me that we still hear some of the same negative connotation and some of the same uh, assumptions and judgments about uh, substance abuse and care for those folks that, that I've seen for years. Um, but understand the job of this commission, and this is where I'm, I'm torn. Uh, our job is to determine whether or not to rezone a piece of property to neighborhood commercial that's in a, it's in a residential area. That is it. Um, we can't get wrapped up uh, in what the proposed use is because that proposed use may be the, the, the center for 20 years and it may be for two and then we have a piece of property that's commercial and amongst residential and and I think what I would what I would propose this morning um, we got a lot of neighbors here um, we've got a lot of folks here supporting this I, I would like to see this tabled for a month um, I would like to see you folks the community as well as the folks with the Curry Center sit down, uh, have some valuable discussion because I think there are a lot of misconceptions. Um, I think there are some, some things that are not being quite understood the way they should. Uh, I also think there are some things that you might be able to offer to the community members. Um, the conservation easement I think is a huge issue. If I lived across the street uh, or across the creek uh, and I knew that was going to be a wooded area for the next hundred years, that may help. So I, I would I would encourage that. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion, and I think it's 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 a 
avenue to take before we get to the point where we have to take a final vote um, of a recommendation to council. So, uh, Mr. Mills, I would ask you if, if you would be willing to um, accept tabling this for a month, uh, withdraw it for one month, and then come back next month uh, and, and hopefully give you time to have some discussion with the uh, adjoining, adjoining property owners um, to talk through what you do, how you do it, um, you know, who's going to be there and when. I mean, I think a lot of that is uh, we've talked about this morning, but I don't think a lot of it was understood. Um, and I think that would help tremendously uh, in moving this forward um, if, we could, if we could have that time. So uh, I guess my, my request or, or, or of you would be, would you consider withdrawing this this month and bringing it back next month? I don't know what your timing is and, and what your uh, needs are, uh, but that would at least give, I think you've given guys, guys time to talk uh, and work through some of the issues uh, that we're hearing this morning. Okay. Conservation easement, a beautiful building down in there, one one way in, no flashing lights. We would be a great neighbor. And I, I promise you, we'll do whatever suits the needs of the guys surrounding us, but I, I see it appreciating the problem. And again, I, I, I think you've what you've brought uh, looks great. Again, our issue is is back to we're in a residential area area that's primary residential and always has been uh and asking for a zoning change and i think in order for us to to be honest in order for us to, to do that um we, we're going to have to have the the adjacent property owners uh having some acceptance of that I, otherwise I, I if i lived there and i didn't know you i didn't know the project and somebody wanted to come in and put re commercial next to my residential I would have a hard time with that, and and so that's that's the conflict that we're having, and I think you're you got most of us up here having is we we understand what you do, we think it's a, a vital resource for the community, but I think we we need to work on getting some community support around you in order to make this happen. We don't want it to look commercial at all. Yes, and again, I don't, I don't know that it's as much about looks as I think you need to educate some folks on what you do and how you do it. Yeah. I think that's the stigma that they're having. It's not about looks. I think it's some, some education. So um, if you would, and I, I need you to come forward, and I guess for the record, to, to request to withdraw it and bring it back um, at a later time. That way, we, either one of you, if, if you would, or, um, you know, that, that would be, I guess that would be my request. That's up to you. We're willing to take All right. Can you come, come up to the microphone, if you would, please, Scott? And okay. Hold on. Hold on. Just a second. All right. So, John, I think what we what we need is a request. They can resubmit next month, but we we would table it. They, he needs a request to withdraw the uh, the, the request for rezoning. Yes, sir. Uh, the code requires you to make a recommendation. Certain amount certain of time. Period of time. So yes. It, it has to be withdrawn or, or motion. Withdrawn. Okay. So I, I guess my 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 question is: Would you? Would you consider withdrawing this and then resubmitting once you've had a chance to sit down and talk with the adjacent property owners? Yeah, if the if the property owners are willing to sit down and talk. Uh, I, I, when I mentioned it, I think I saw every yeah. property owner shake their head and say yes. That's that's what they would like to do. Okay. So I think they're I think they're willing to, to listen, and um, I, I hope they're willing to to uh, understand that you know. I want to be clear, this property is going to be developed, I mean, whether it's a tract home or whatever it is. Sure. In Lexington, 18 acres is 18 acres. Uh, yeah. The gentleman made a great point about traffic. You know, we're going to get you a know, lot less traffic out of this. We're talking about using so, a couple acres out of 17. Yeah. So there's there's some benefit, I think, to what, what's being offered here um, that I hope folks will be open uh, to listening to and, and talking with. So. Um, again, I, I thank you very much for your time. Uh, sure. At this point, it has been withdrawn, so we will take it back up when it's resubmitted. Yes, sir, Britt? Mr. Chairman, yes. I'd like to make the mills and everyone else aware. Um, we can make a meeting room available at Town Hall if you guys want to schedule a, a meeting. Sure. That way, it's a, probably a little bit easier than going yeah. door to door. <laughs> yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. And I, and I think at this point, you've probably got, uh, there's in the record, there's petitions with uh, names and addresses. So I think you probably have a pretty good list of folks that you can make reach out and make contact with. We'd be glad to do that. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, we're going we're gonna to take about a, uh, real quickly. Um, they're saying three acres. What is, are, are 
are they going to have an option on the rest of the land? This, this is what I want you to you guys to sit and have a talk about is, is yeah, what he's going to plan for that, because I think that's going to help you come to some comfort with this. I, I just want to also say that, yes, it is not just about property values. It is having that rezone. I'm saying. So, all right, so thank you very much. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we will resume. Come back. Uh, and we will resume back up at the... Uh, at the top at item number one of old business um, which is sketch plan approval for a new subdivision uh, adjacent to 165 Zinker Road. John? Mr. Chairman I'll yes. be recusing myself from this item as I have in the past. All right thank you. <coughs> Great Southern Homes is requesting sketch plan approval for a single family subdivision being planned adjacent to 165 Zinker Road. The subdivision will have 105 lots. We've looked at this a few times before. The allowable density of residential development is determined by the classification of the street that provides access. Zinker Road is classified as a local road which allows six units per acre. The proposed development will have two and a half units per acre. Properties with PR2 zoning do not have a minimum lot size as long as the homes can meet the minimum setbacks and driveway requirements. This sub subdivision has a minimum lot area of 7,779 square feet. The average lot area is 8,670 square feet, and the maximum lot area is 19,838 square feet. The minimum lot area on this project exceeds the minimum required for a PR1 subdivision, but the requested setbacks require it to be permitted as a cluster development with PR2 zoning. Uh, the developer is proposing a 20-foot front yard setback and a 10-foot secondary setback for corner lots. Uh, that, I mentioned that because the land development ordinance requires secondary setbacks to be equal to the front yard setback, so that is something we'll have to be worked out with the developer. Um, and the proposed rear yard setback is currently 10 feet with five foot side yard setbacks. Open space, the town's land development ordinance requires at least 20% of the area to be open space with at least 50% of that to be active recreation space. And the code mentions with tennis courts, swimming pools or other approved amenities. The amount of open space provided meets the requirement of the ordinance, but there's not a lot of detail on right. the active open space. Access to the development will be obtained through a single entrance. Oh, excuse me, I've skipped a paragraph here. To meet the active open space requirement, the plan includes a two and a quarter acre park picnic area in common area four and a mulch walking trail along the wetlands area. We've had some discussions about enhancements of these areas, but they, the developers may be able to provide a little bit more detail about that. Um, access single entrance off of Zinker Road. A traffic study was completed with no changes to the road system being recommended. However, the developer has agreed and they can add some more detail to this or Randy can. Um, agreed to make some improvements identified in our long range transportation plan to the intersection of Zinker Road and Industrial Drive. Um, I believe that about covers it. Yeah, All right. Any other questions, or uh, Scott Morrison can come up and speak on behalf of the developer. Um, yeah, I think why don't, why don't we start there? Why don't we start with that, and then I, I may have some questions for our transportation engineer. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Scott Morrison with uh, Great Southern Homes, and uh, got uh, I'll probably just get right to what y'all. Are probably going to ask about is the uh, you know kind of what we're thinking for the for activity wise mm -hmm. on, on the on the open space. So, um, you know, we we actually did to give probably more information than you want. But, uh, we did look at uh, uh, installing a pool and putting it in the neighborhood, and we we looked at the cost to our homeowners from an HOA fee, and um, our our budget if we have a pool is about eight seventy five a year for a HOA fee. Out of pool, it's about 400. Um, and after talking with our sales folks, that is a for for a hundred unit subdivision. It just that that really hurts our HOA fee. Um, really? 
why, so, why is it so why, uh, high? Why would it be? Because there's only 100 people to spread the cost. Well, well I, I guess the question, but just more pointed. So you, okay, you said without any amenities, it's a it's a four hundred dollar a year assessment. What's that cover? Uh, the SCNG lighting, the street lighting, the entrance, the uh, the street lighting is covered by the town. One per six is covered. Correct, Britt? Yes, that's correct. It's covered by the so town. I can, so we can pull that out. Okay. Awesome. So I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what because I we, we we have a I know one of 119 home subdivision that has a pool, lights, and pond that they maintain with about a five hundred dollar assessment. So I'm trying yeah. to figure out why that, where that number is coming from. Oh, we use uh, we use a pretty reputable management okay. company, and that's that's the budget they All right. come up with. Okay, thank you. That's right. Go ahead. So, so, so pool we saw we, not saw, we, we saw that fee is detrimental. Um, okay. So our our concept is to to really uh, to spend the effort on enhancing the park area, given uh, not just having uh, a mulch trail. Um, I mean, it will be a mulch trail, but to define it, I think John and I talked about we had some issues in the past for those mulch trails just kind of disappearing into the woods. So uh, some kind of landscape order that defines it and lets it stay there gives people a reason to actually use it. Um, we, we have two, on, on the layout there are two uh, open areas. One is towards the entrance and then the, the park area in the back. We feel that if we have some sort of individual play or workout station, you know, workout station is probably a bad word, but um, some kind of activity that gives people a reason to go from one to the other, they'll actually use the trail and, and, and receive the benefit of all that uh, open space that we have. All right. Um, how about the concern? It appears that you have four corner lots. Um, that and John talked about work, those being required to meet your uh, front setbacks as well. Right now you have those at 10. Is that going to be a significant burden to adjust that to 20? Um, we, we can we can certainly compromise on that. But okay. We can work through that. All right. Then the other, before we get to, to Randy's questions, the other thing I've got is you're proposing a 20-foot front yard setback. Um, but your property, your lots are actually large enough to, to fit into a PR1 subdivision, which generally has a, a larger front yard setback. Given our concern that we have everywhere in the town with people parking in the streets, um, is, is there a reason why you didn't propose to move those back to maybe a 25 foot front setback in order to provide additional room for parking in a driveway? Uh, we could do 25. Okay. Uh, the, the 30 was, um, yeah, I think the PR1 is a 30. And uh, that mm -hmm. was why we had asked part of the part, part yeah. of the reason we were going for the. It's just, uh, it, we, and I'll be honest, you know, one of the things it, it, that I was considering, I mean, we, we just did uh, Madison Park over on 378, and they had a, a, a closer front yard setback, and one of the things we asked them to do was put in wider roads uh, versus, you know, moving them back because of just the way their, their property was. And I, sure. here it seemed easier for you to move them back a little bit maybe than add more asphalt, yeah. uh, which is uh, a higher cost. Uh, I think we can. We can agree to, or I don't know if it goes in the minutes or whatever, for the 25 foot front okay. side. All right. And I still, like I said, I still have concerns about knowing exactly what your, your improved recreational space is going to be. I, um, I, I have a picture of what we're, I, I brought a picture of what, uh, kind of what we're trying to go after. Okay. But the pictures behind it look very, um, the renderings did not come out very well. Um, I'd love to share them with you guys if, okay. uh, if yeah. it's. Yes. cover picture is a, is a park that's actually in forest acres mm -hmm. it's it's been there for a very long time but they they I would say within the last few years kind of ramped it up right they, um, the, the concept is just to have a spread out we, we have enough area back there in the back to have a nice spread out individual play not not uh, I think in this picture you see one or two of the um, I'll call them the church playgrounds the, the, the articles where there's the, the, the slide and everything's all connected. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also swing sets spread out and, and actually Heathwood Park in a similar area does something like that also. Um, so we'd like something like that and, and I apologize the, the second page, the second, third, 
and fourth pages, they were rendering to show what could be in there, but it looked kind of like a horse corral. <laughs> so I, that's why I included the, 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 the cover pictures. It's more the concept. We, we have some trees back in there, uh, so we have some shade, some play. Uh, just not necessarily just cramming it all into one little playground space, just using the whole area. How far back behind the houses would this potentially start? Um, on, on the layout, it's a it's its own separate area. You actually, is, we, we would it's have, the one all the way at the back corner. Yes, that where your wetlands stop, and it kind of goes over to the property. And, and line. there's an existing there's existing right. crossing over that yeah. draw. We would use that existing crossing and use that uh, utilize that area. Okay. And I, and I apologize. Which, I don't know which common area number that yeah. is, but it's uh, the parking it's just, back. Yeah, it's at the very top of the page. It's it's the area that, that immediately abuts the inner industrial zone property. Right that we discussed last yeah. time. All right. um, I guess, John, they need, if I read this right, they need about four acres of what <coughs> we would call improved active open space, correct? And a 40 acre development? 20%? Yeah, it would be eight yeah. acres, and half of that would be four acres? <laughs> so, correct? <laughs> okay. All right, so I guess my, my question was how, how big are you intending? this this park to be i believe we have two and a half acres in the back okay is that, is that correct two and a half acres then we've got the 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 length of the walking trail and we have the common area up front that would um i'm sorry i'm going to tell you what, what number i think they're all numbered i just can't read it it's that common area number one out front that has the ability to have another play item of, or some sort of station to to get people to want to be there um, so we we have the two and a half the common area up front is we can make that really as big as we want to um, plus the plus the wall path okay all right um, any questions <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. What, what's the significance of these uh, adjusted buffer areas Ask my engineer about that. Um, David, could you? Is it setback averaging? Yeah, you're talking about here and here. Uh, the normal uh, buffer width is 50 feet, but you can go down to 25 feet if you make up that 25 feet somewhere else. Like make the buffer easier. If you go down the buffer somewhere, you need to increase the buffer somewhere else. So this just shows how we went down in some areas and then increased it in some other areas for for a net of an, an increased buffer area and, and that's setbacks from the streams yes. it's not the setbacks you guys normally deal with correct that's the wetland water buffer yeah. oh. Sorry. and just a question yeah i reckon we've answered this before are these cul-de-sacs are they the radius in there good enough for a fire truck to turn around in? I don't know. That's the that's the required radius. That's the required. Yeah. Okay. I would assume that's. The, yeah, I'm yeah. assuming something that will be something Mr. Edwards will be reviewing to make sure that they're built according to the required code. He, he would in the county as well. Yeah. 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 So. School bus is more my concern than the fire well, truck necessarily because yeah, yeah. that's going to be in there daily. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. All right. Any other questions? I wonder what yes. what the improvements um, from the developer for the L tip at that intersection are. Yeah, that's why I was, I was, that's why I was going to ask him or Randy or somebody to, to address yeah. what we talked about what, on Zinker Road. Yeah, again, Zinker and Industrial, I think, is where you guys are looking at doing some improvements. Yes, sir. Um, I, and I don't know the name of the project. It, I guess it's Zinker Road Industrial Boulevard intersection improvements. Hi, Randy. Is there a question? Well, I mean, what, I guess, what, I guess is, there, is, there, is there a name for that, that intersection project? That intersection, no. The, okay. That intersection was identified as part of the local transportation improvement plan that council set out to identify any and all you know, areas that were in need of improvements based on existing conditions. And so this, that being the case, 
Zager Road at the intersection of industrial was identified as a problematic area. So we, in discussion, discussed with um, Scott about actually addressing a portion of that problem in the area. And, uh, and as far as I know, they've agreed to do that. Okay. So we have. So I guess somebody explain to us what that what that entails. Uh, which is why we should, <laughs> should have, have the drawing. Let's come at it. basic Zinger Road Industrial Intersection Improvement, the all encompassing includes a deceleration lane on Industrial Boulevard or Industrial Drive, and then includes a left and right out lanes coming from Zinger onto the intersection. So the improvements that um, Scott's group has agreed to do is the Zinker Road portion, which is just essentially a symmetrical widening, mm -hmm. which will allow for that additional turn lane mm -hmm. uh, to be at that location. Okay. Um, so we just, you know, kind of parting it out. But this is also in, you know, that there's really at this stage, there's not a need for the improvements at his doorstep. But yet all of that traffic will actually come through intersection that has been identified so, okay. so at this so point it's, right. it's probably more critical for us to get the improvements at, at industrial rather than a turn lane or diesel lane at his neighborhood that is correct okay all right any other questions well the one thing that I see is um, we're gonna this is approval of a site plan but this is the same site plan that we saw previously mm -hmm. that has does not have any of the improvements on it that we had requested or discussed previously so as and, and I'm still concerned about the open space the green space I'm still I mean okay you, you mentioned the pool and I understand your issues um, in my other high paying job I'm on an HOA and we have a pool <laughs> and I know your other and, zero pay and, job and, and, you know and my but I take it very in high regard to maintain that neighborhood, and I'm, I know what we pay for our HOA fees, and it's a lot less. It's not eight hundred seventy-five dollars, um, but um, I, I'm still concerned that I'm not. I don't see. Okay, I see a park, but I, I'm really not seeing your your design for some kind of green space according to what the town is requiring. Of him to have a 50 percent to have 50 percent and so I I'm not comfortable in an improvement of a site plan that I don't that I'm not seeing that for it's my is my concern I mean for you to, to tell me okay yeah but I mean I need to see it on this plan because this is what we this is what we ultimately approve or disapprove okay, so you'd like you're saying you'd like to see those improvements shown on the Exactly what we planned out. Whether this was the uh, the the park concept that showed pieces and parts on on this plan well, itself. And you keep mentioning the walking trails, which I think just walking trails themselves we have not we've decided do not qualify for a, a green space unless there's like exercise equipment on those walking trails. Um, it's active equipment if it's paved. They don't qualify just straight out of the code. They right. can qualify if you guys approve them as an exception mm -hmm. with whatever requirements that you want to put on them. And if you want to say there needs to be equipment there, that's an acceptable requirement that you could put on there. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> as far as it being on the plan and it's completely up to the body how you want to handle it, you could give staff specific things that you want to see and make sure that that they review that or you could require that it be brought back either one of those are, are valid options like it doesn't show the 25 foot instead of 20 setbacks on here but that's agreed to in the minutes and is just as good as if it was actually shown on there. right I understand that. so I, either, either way yeah and I guess and, and, I, and that's what I was I was thinking I'm trying to, to, to go through in my mind um, mr. Hanson I guess I'll, I'll ask you um, you know, because we've, we're, we're beginning to take more and more uh, notice of, of the active green space requirement. Um, is that something you would, you would prefer to see the commission weigh in on specifically or, you know, uh, his design to have a park and perhaps some other active areas 
combined to meet that four acre total? Is, is that something you would be comfortable for us sending to staff to make sure that he works with you as a contingency on our approval? Let me throw out a compromise. Okay. You all have been given a concept and staff is more than willing to monitor the development and of the concept if at such point that we get into a, um, a disagreement with the developer about what our view of the concept versus theirs we can always bring it back to you but okay. Um, I think we're we're fine with moving it forward, given the fact that this one's been hanging out there. For I, know. I, I don't have that way, and that's exactly a, my thought. Is quite we, a while. We've, we've been chewing on this one for for eight months, it seems. Um, so it, it's I, again, I, I think this concept of the park is very is much closer to the the concept of, of active green space than a walking trail is, um, yes. and I, and I would be acceptable with with moving it forward with with staff contention that they're going to monitor this and make sure that it meets the the four acre required minimum um, for active green space between the, the combination of a park and, and other active areas along a walking trail, um, but just to make sure that there are active spaces there. Well, I will say this, the product that we started with and the product that we're now looking at, I think is, is a lot closer to what you all okay. and, and uh, uh, Scott has given us some things on this plan that we like to see as far as the larger setbacks and the improvements in the Zinco Road. So I'm yeah. comfortable monitoring the okay. active area. All right. Any other questions? All right. Hearing none, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to accept. Um, the move to PR1? No, it's, it's, no. it's already been zoned PR2. Oh, PR2. So all we're, all we're okay. looking for here is, a, is, a, is an approval of the sketch plan. plan? Approval of, I'll make a motion to approve the sketch plan as it has been put before with the um, minimum requirement of the 20% um, green space or um, playground space, something. Mm -hmm equipment and with staff following through on um, making sure that comes to fruition. All right. We have a motion. You got that, Ms. Karen? All right. And do I was going I was going to modify it. <laughs> All right. Do we have it? Do we have a second? All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I guess I would offer um, if you would be so inclined, I would offer an, an amendment that uh, would require the 25 front yard setbacks has been agreed to, yes. as well as the four corner lots uh, um, working with staff to address those setbacks on the sides there as well. And Zinker Road. And the Zinker Road improvements. Down yeah. All right. Absolutely. All right. So yes. you agree to that? Yes. Second's good. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All right. Thank you. That is unanimous. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are you back to work now? Oh, I'm going to wait. <laughs> All right. <laughs> item two, John. Uh, let's let's move through the rest of this break. <laughs> Are we having lunch today? <laughs> 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 we have a breakfast. Like Got some one. biscuits. <laughs> 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 There's a biscuit left downstairs. I know. All right. Go ahead, John. Uh, new business item number one. Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church owns 9.2 acres on two parcels located at 226 Corley Mill Road and has petitioned to annex the properties. Properties in town near this one are zoned limited commercial and high density residential. Corley Mill Road is classified as a collector road. Mm -hmm. Due to the surrounding conditions and the use of the property, the recommended zoning for these parcels is limited commercial and the recommended classification of Corley Mill Road is collector. Okay. Any questions? Motion approved as stated. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. Next item, John. New Start Homes LLC owns two acres located at 231 Powell Drive and has petitioned to annex the property. A single family home is being constructed on the site. Properties in town near this one are zoned protected residential and protected residential two. 
Powell Drive is classified already as a local road. Due to the surrounding conditions and the use of the property, the recommended zoning is protected residential. See, we do get protected residential. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or one house at least. All right, any discussion? Motion approved is stated. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, next item is sketch plan approval for subdivision on 118 Bickley Road, John. Executive Construction Homes is requesting sketch plan approval for a single family subdivision being planned at 118 Bickley Road. The subdivision will have 35 lots on 8.9 acres. Again, the allowable density is determined by the classification of the street that provides access. Bickley Road is currently classified as a limited local road which allows three units per acre in a zero lot line development. The proposed development will exceed this allowance unless Bickley Road is reclassified as a local road. It is currently classified as limited local. Uh, properties with PR2 zoning do not have a minimum lot size as long as the homes can meet the minimum setbacks and driveway requirements. This subdivision has a minimum lot area of 6,600 square feet. The average lot area is is also 6,600 square feet with a maximum lot area of 7,000 square feet. The developer is proposing a 20-foot front yard setback, a 15-foot rear yard setback, and a three-foot side yard setback. Again, open space, 20% of the area is to be open space with at least 50% of that to be recreation space as we've previously discussed. The amount of open space provided for this development meets the requirement with 1.84 acres. It's unclear whether this calculation includes the detention pond. Um, to meet the active open space requirement, the plan includes an unpaved walking trail along the rear of the project. Access to the development will be obtained through a single entrance off of Bickley Road. The project is intended to be a gated community with internal subdivision streets being privately maintained. A traffic study has not been provided for this project. However, the project is anticipated to increase peak hour trips through the intersection of South Lake Drive and Gibson Road by approximately 5%. South Lake Drive and Gibson Road is the closest intersection that is also included in the LTIP plan. That's why I mentioned that. A review of the project yielded questions about whether the proposed active open space amenity being uh, meets the requirement additionally for this project to be compliant with the density requirements in the zoning ordinance bickley road needs to be reclassified and finally to ensure there are no conflicts with postal service regulations which we will talk about in the future they'll need to plan for mail delivery using cluster mailboxes all right is is there anybody here from executive construction Okay, please come forward, I guess, and uh, introduce yourself for the record. Uh, I'm Eddie Yandel. I'm the owner of Executive Construction. Um, the project we're proposing is uh, through some studies we've had done in the town area, actually the Lexington area. It's essentially a baby, a baby boomer uh, house. We've had uh, some very good success with it in the northeast sector in a subdivision called Wood Creek Farms. We have our own section over there. And I think we have like, uh, we've been over here for about almost three years now. We've had over 30 people request the same product and you know, anywhere near the town that we could possibly bring it in. And since I've been looking for land ever since, and uh, this particular piece here, we've, uh, we've got under contract with you know, hopefully trying to get the same concept over here to them. It's not a low-end product, it's an, it's an upper-end product. Um, these houses will be anywhere from three hundred to four hundred fifty thousand dollars to be all brick. Uh, it's a maintenance-free community. Uh, it's a, essentially what we call a lock and leave. You, uh, they don't do anything to the outside of their houses. They, they, they don't cut the grass, they don't fix the sprinklers, they don't trim the bushes. If the bush, bush dies, you get the, these people here like living their life. They like. Uh, you know they're they're done working hard like I guess all of us are at this point in time. But so you know the concept from the open standpoint of putting the, putting the trail in, you know they don't have kids anymore, they have dogs. So they're going to walk up and down that trail and they're going to talk to their friends and we're going to you know put maybe put a gazebo or something there. But ultimately the trail is going to be used for them to um, walk their dogs. 
Is this age restricted? Is it? Age I'm not going to. I'm not going to age restrict it. Okay. So so it may not be kid free. Well, it's probably. I mean, it may not. Okay. But there's not many families that like moving in to this this size lot. To clarify for the lock and leave and maintenance free, it's in their association. Yeah, this is all in association fee. It's uh, it's all included uh, in inside their HOA fee on a monthly basis. And we, ha and we have had we have had a few uh, single fam single females buy in uh, because of the security it's a gated section over there too um, young professionals a couple single males actually buy but over 85 percent of the buyers that we've had in this particular product where we were trying it is is the baby boomer just okay. to I still I still wonder though about the again as we talked about but the last green. sketch point is is the the green space in the active portion. Um, you know, and so I, that that leaves me some concern because again, we start we start making exceptions yeah. in one project when we get requests because you're you're only uh, about a mile from the one we just discussed, um, you know, and, and requiring him to, to to really spend some money and do those improvements and um, and not here uh, mm -hmm. puts us in the town in a in an awkward position. So, um, I mean, I guess we could leave that up to staff to work through with him yet again as we did the last one. Yeah. I guess I. One question I want to ask, and, and maybe Randy can, to, the, these hammerhead intersections at the end of this thing, have you seen the sketch plan? Is that okay? Is that acceptable? I mean, you, you, you say you do get kids. I mean, I, I guess you're not going to have school buses going through here because you've got a gated community. They'll have to walk yeah. to the front if they have a kid. Okay. I mean, that's so at garbage it. service wouldn't come through. But I also, I we discussed garbage the service does come through. It wouldn't work out once we had to get the, the open space requirements inside. Yeah, the, 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 the hammer, the, the, the skateboard cul-de-sac doesn't constitute open space. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I just, I mean, we, we got garbage service that has to go through there and pick up garbage cans, and so you're going to have garbage trucks backing up, moving around. But it is, I mean, again, private. It's private maintenance. Well, just that's a safety issue for me. I mean, I, but I, I get it. So, um, okay, I just want to make sure. So, and they and there are deed restrictions that note that these are privately maintained roads and will never be accepted for maintenance by the town. We were given that already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I have one more one more thing. We, yeah. we were planning on doing also. We were also planning on tying in the uh, sidewalk all the way down to Gibson Road Gibson. to tie it into the park. We feel like that park's a big asset to this to this buyer. Mm -hmm. and for as far as open space goes, that we're going to spend a good bit of money there, getting this thing DOT approved down to Gibson Road inside mm -hmm. the right of way that's there. All right. I'm assuming Eddie that being that it's gated, you have perimeter fencing around the whole entire. It's property. either going to be a green fence or a, or or a wall. We haven't decided what we're going to do yet. And I and I know you're you're purchasing. A small portion of this site but this is a, a uh, several large tracts of land that have been for sale for years um, have you had any discussion with the owner as to, to possible future development we've looked at doing the whole project and okay. um, at, the, at this time we couldn't it's got a big pond in the middle of it mm -hmm. we couldn't get to the left side of the pond um, to make the numbers work it's got a big green space a, actually it's a high, high land to the left side of it but we can't get to the back left corner of the property. At this point in time, the, the owner was willing to um, carve this piece off for us, but you'll see to the right side of it, we did leave them access to the back of the property. Well, and that's our, our concern is we, we've talked several times uh, about, you know, we have large tracts of land that are on the edge of town that are ripe for development is um, trying to, to do a, a master plan type concept yeah. rather than piecemealing where we end up with, you know, four curb cuts rather than one or two. and. Um, making sure that everything meshes. So I just, um, for the record, I, I, we, whenever we come back, we're gonna, uh, this this may be a, a self-contained uh, area, but that, you know, the larger pieces in the back may be something that we'd look to, to do a master plan with, uh, uh, with larger lots and homes and, you know, as we get back towards Gibson Pond, so. Um, all right, any further questions? I have, I have yes, one. Yes, sir, Roscoe. Uh, I assumed it. Where you have your access, there's part of a curve, curve right there. If you, if you 
you go down to the middle of your subdivision, I mean, are you, you've got that checked out as far as the safety part and that? Yeah, entrance? based on what DOT gave preliminarily, they wanted us to put it at this end, not further up. This is where they, we, they recommended us putting it huh. further down for, for line of sight. I had it in the middle originally. <laughs> yeah, that, that curve's not a very sharp curve. No, it's, it's not. not. No, not, not no it's curve. not. But that is surprising they want you to put it closer to Gibson than further away. That's, that's a little surprising. But the site distance gets worse if you go down. Does it? Yeah, okay. the, fur yeah. the further up you go, the worse, the worse, okay. the worse site you have. All right. That's why we want to do well, it. Less, oh, okay. less, less sidewalk to put in as well, so that's, yeah. that's not a bad thing. All right. Any other questions? Uh, again, my concern is do can we approve a sketch plan that is not does not adhere to the town requirements of the zoning for the open space. And I mean, I just think, I think that puts a lot of burden on staff to continually have to keep up with that when at this level, you know, we can say, hey, we need to see that. So yeah, staff does have to do some, but I mean, that's just my concern. And like I say, we, we did just tell this guy, hey, that, you know, a walking path does not really qualify for green space. And even that you have not age restricted this, so you don't know that a family with two children doesn't come in and, you know, wants a playground, I mean, wants a different type of, so back to the requirement, the open space, I mean, the sketch drawing, the site plan, I, I don't, know that we can approve that without seeing what's required by the town what is required by the town um, 20 percent uh, 20 percent of the total acreage it has to be green space and half of that has to be an active green space mm -hmm. so you got eight acres here so you're looking at you know mm -hmm. I guess less than an acre that would be required to be active green space which got uh, park something you know, like say what he showed us something of that nature I guess I guess, you know, at some point, I think the Commissioner Gibson's right. We, we do need to be engaged in, in determining what's appropriate. Um, but I do also do think, I mean, you know, John, that's what John gets paid a lot of money for. Um, I understand. <laughs> a lot of money. So, but I mean, so I mean, I, I guess I, I don't want to overburden staff with having to, to, to monitor these things and track them, but I mean, they're going to have to work with them for permitting and approval anyway. Um, but it's up to the commission as to whether you want to see this back with the concept attached to it um, so that we can start making sure that we're consistent across the board with each development. Um, what, what are you talking about you want, John, inside? What, what's, what is the concept we're, we're shooting for? <laughs> that's, what I, that's the question I'm asking is that. All I can tell you is what the code says. The code says with swimming pools, tennis courts, or other amenities approved by the approving authority. They're the approving authority unless they delegate that back to me. Yeah, so could that, that be a paid point? Well, for, the, the question that I have is, does the submitted green space include the detention pond? Because in my opinion, that's not usable green space. If that's what it is, then we've got a bigger issue. That being said, if we're putting a walking trail behind the houses and he's willing to voluntarily connect the subdivision down to Gibson Road, that's essentially an amenity for the subdivision. Wouldn't we have to kind of look at it from a case by case, depending on oh, the yeah. traffic of the buyer? Yeah, maybe, given the location of this. Yeah, yeah. well, location and, the, and his his demographic. I mean, he's built this in, in Wood Creek and, you know, 80 some 85 percent of his buyers are, are baby boomers. Is, the product yeah. in Wood Creek is next to a golf course. Right. Well, but this is going to be next to a park. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you got to provide. <laughs> so it's it's park. it's what's you know yeah does, what does the did, is the detention pond counted in the green space or not? Did you have that? So there you go. So it is. So, so I'm not, I, I think that that, that that opens the question up as to okay. whether that meets your green space. Yes. Anymore. So that 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 leads us back to the, this this doesn't achieve the minimum standard that's required. How much is yours? it over? You 
Okay, wait a minute. So 0.95. Come, come forward, please. <laughs> so I, I go here. So we've got 0.9. I'm sorry. You are, you are. Kristen Morris with Civil Engineering of Columbia. Okay. So can you tell us again your green space numbers? We have got a total project area of 8.9 acres. We've got 0.95 acres of green space, which includes the pond, and then 0 0.89 acres of active open space, which will have the park benches and the walking path. So the 0.89 is part of the 0.95? No, that's separate. Okay, so they're separate. 0.95 of plain green space, and then okay. a separate 0.89 of active open space, which will include the walking path, the benches, okay. gazebo, things of that nature. Yes, it does. You can't um, the pond. So basically, right out an acre. Well, if the point nine five includes, you can't include the detention. Well, you're active, and then you but you've got to have close to about one point nine, one point eight something acres total of green space, and they're close to that if you count the pond. Yeah. But I'm assuming that pond is going to be. A, is it a retention or a detention bond? It will be. Uh, we haven't we have gotten that far yet. Okay. I mean, as you say, I, you know, I've seen neighborhoods with retention ponds that you know use them for put fish in them and help people fish and use them as active space. But it obviously isn't going to work for a detention pond. It's going to be stay dry most of the time. Right. So, um, I, so it seems to me that maybe there's some additional work that needs to be done to make sure that we we I I, I can. I can accept the, the walking trail as, as active for, for this community and given its location, but I think we need to make sure that we have the, the appropriate acreage of green space that's been allotted. I, I don't know how big, how big is the detention pond. How much does the pond kick it over? Um, I don't have or how much does the pond incorporate into the green space? Yeah. How much of the pond Yes, sir. So I would interject that um, your concern is the active green space, right? Well, that, that, you've got, you've that, got that, total that's both of But but the, the active is the is the correct number. That's the real. That's the base of what the concern is, correct? Well, no. Well, well I think it was the basic concern until we realized that there's not enough total green space. Well, either. but but I think I think she's told you that there is enough green space because the pond is, how much of the pond is included in the active green space no she said most None. Of it. okay but you have to have almost two acres of total green space and Half what's, of that, what's your total green space so you add your active so and it's half two acres but the pond we included the pond in the, the pond, pond is included the pond in that two acres included. but not in the active but not in the active it's okay. always the 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 stormwater okay. is always included in the total in the green total space right. The concern is if it's included in the active green space okay. because it can't be a pond and active green space. Okay. The pond is not included in the active open space. Yeah. Yeah. It is always included in the green space, but it's not the majority of the green space. Okay. Well, but I mean, you're we, right there. I, I understand that, but we we also have the walking trail. This is site specific. And it's a, again, this is a small development that it's connected to a park. So I, I, I get that now. I, I wasn't thinking. And with the stringent stormwater requirements. Well, with 0.89 active, you're almost there. I mean, just about. Well, I mean, that meets the active. I think that meets the active. Yeah. We're supposed to meet. Or right at it. We're supposed to meet the way the ordinance reads now. Everything we have is supposed to meet the way the ordinance reads. The active percentage versus the, the overall. Yeah, I think percentage wise, it seems like yes. we're close. I don't have a calculator, but uh, and that's I, I actually had to go get some okay. more land to, to okay. do this. So I guess the question then becomes for us is, is on a site specific basis, is the walking trail acceptable? I'm, I'm, a, I'm not sure I have a problem with that. If that as long as they're carrying the sidewalk as down to Gibson and they can walk right around to the park. As long as there's connectivity to the park. And that's there. I would add, I think the ordinance is written so that just exactly what Mr. Barry said is it, yeah. it, it becomes site specific every single time unless it's a tennis court or, or swimming pool. And that, those are automatically accepted. Anything else you have to approve. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. And, and of course, this is contingent upon us uh, addressing the road classification as well in the next item. Mm -hmm. so any further questions, discussion? We, re we reclassify the road. I know it doesn't have any uh, 
connection to the specifications of the road. It just re Bit the road is not as good a road. It's it's what I call a farm to market road. It is. It is, but it has been improved since it was classified as a limited local. It's, it's yeah, but local. we got to classify it as a local, right? Yeah, we need to be so, yeah, yeah. yes, my, my recommendation in the next item is to reclassify the road. And okay. that was Randy's also. He felt that the road has been, has because limited local is generally dirt roads and roads that are far too narrow to meet standards. And local is exactly what you're talking about. The farm to market, just ditches, and it's wide enough, but it's not anything special. If change, changing the classification of the road, is that up the status of that road for improvements down the, road, down the future? No, it's purely a zoning issue. It, it's not a it's not a transportation issue. Yeah, yeah. The, the, road, did, the road is only zoned this way in front of this property. When you come off of Gibson, it's, it's the right zone, and at the end of this property, Ford Industrial, on your map, you showed me. The only spot, it's not, well, it's not. Low, and, that, low, and that's because this this, this property is the only piece that's not in town. Yeah, yeah. The rest of it's in town, and we've already addressed that's, this that's issue. Yeah. So, so we addressed. Chris Myers is addressed as local, John. Yeah. So, so I read so that absolutely. It just fills in the piece, is what yeah, it does. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That's that's the only the only spot the whole road that's not. Okay. Road. So that makes sense. Property. We we, we need to address it. We're going to ask for the whole the whole the, whole, the rest of the road's already so it's already limited already limited level property. Okay. All right. Any further questions? Okay. Motion. Motion to approve site uh, sketch plan is submitted. All right. For um, with, I guess the add-on that on we accept the walking trails is the. Well, I mean, we approved the site plan. It's approved. I think the add-on potentially is the sidewalk going all the way from. All right. So that's the connectivity. The sidewalk to Gibson Park. Yeah. Or, no, get room. Get room. Sorry, too far. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Close. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. All right. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, play. Raise your right hand. Thank you, Patrick Animals. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Look forward to seeing, seeing your community. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks all for right. being patient. Yes. <laughs> all right. Next item is a uh, recommendation on annexation and road classification, John. Um, Kevin Johnson, soon to be Mr. Yandel, owns 11.2 acres located at 118 Bickley Road and has petitioned to annex the property. Mr. Yandel's 35 unit single family subdivision is being planned on the site. Properties in town near this one are zoned protected residential and Bickley Road is classified as a limited local road. Due to surrounding conditions and the intended use of the property, the recommended zoning for the property is protected residential two with Bickley Road being classified as a local road. It is further recommended to reclassify the portions of Bickley Road already in town that are not currently local to local. Okay. Um, one quick question, I don't want to belabor this. This says 11.2 acres, but the site plan back here says 8.9. Mr. Yandel is, uh, as my understanding, is purchasing 8.9. The parcel we 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 asked for when when the project came forward, we asked to annex the entire parcel. Okay, so there's a strip, I guess, behind. There was not a descriptive, yeah, uh, something we could put on the uh, on the annexation petition. So we took the the full plat and, and just asked to annex the whole thing, full okay. 11 acres. So. All right. So it looks like there's maybe a little bit of strip down the right side and then behind. My the understanding is most of us behind it, they, they've got their big house there too. Mm -hmm. And they're wanting to have a bumper okay. between us and the house at this point in time. Okay. We tried to get all of it, they didn't want okay. they, they to control it. They were still willing to annex it all in because that's in their house and that's in yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. I just, I was just curious as to why the discrepancy there. All right. So. All right. <coughs> Do we have a motion? Motion approved to state it. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, Roscoe, thank you very much. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And that is unanimous as well. All right, we've already dealt with uh, item number five. Uh, and then we, yeah, we get to deal with the last item. John? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you
Everybody go to the post office again. Yeah, everybody, everybody go to the post office and talk to the postmaster. <laughs> The U.S. Postal Service has changed their policies for residential mail delivery in new subdivision and is now requiring the use of cluster mailboxes. This change has created some confusion with some of our recent subdivisions because the developer may not have been aware of the new requirement when the subdivision was planned. To prevent future problems with this policy, the Postal Service is asking local governments to codify the cluster box requirement in their land development regulations. Based on feedback from the building industry, the commission is being asked to recommend approval of an amendment to the land development ordinance adding the following language. U.S. Postal Service approved locations for all mail facilities and residential developments shall be shown on all site plans submitted to the approving authority. That's all we're asking. That way we put it out there as notification that you're going to have to do this. Okay. Any discussion? Does this require previously built subdivisions no. to go to this? No, ma'am. Okay. It's only from what I from what I deal with. It's only future phases and new existing subdivisions or new subdivisions. So you could potentially have half of a neighborhood with individual mm -hmm. mailboxes and half with a a central located. That is correct. Yep. So next development of Bar Lake or whatever could have a central. So they're already they're already there already now. There. Yeah, it started. Yeah, that, Bar Lake started out. That was that was one time. of the reasons we kind of wanted to push this forward was because Bar Lake started and then this requirement came in and it was kind of a Bar Lake was on the front end of the enforcement by the Postal Service of the requirement. And the question I ask when we were having our meeting about this is. Um, you know, does this get us involved with the federal with the federal government? And Britt explained there were other federal requirements that we are required to meet with stormwater and road size and whatnot. So, my question from yeah. a staff perspective is: Is this something that you think will save you time and energy down the road? No. Now you're not staff. <laughs> He's staff. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to figure out, are we, are we getting in the waters that we shouldn't be in, or is this something that's going to help you guys deal with deal with development? You know, I, I, I quite frankly don't think so. really want to, uh, this isn't our issue uh, as far as where they put them, how they put them, those types of things. I'm not going to get involved in that. That's why we wrote the language of the ordinance the way we did. Just as notification that this is a requirement, you got to put it in there. How you do it is not really it's something that we're going to spend staff time doing. I, I would say that really the only goal is to help the neighborhood. So the neighborhood looks a little bit better so that there's some forethought put in. Because sure, every neighborhood that Frank does from now on, he's going to make sure that those mailboxes are in there. But we have lots of the builders who build one neighborhood and they might work on it for five years and then they go to another neighborhood They're, if they don't put that forethought in there it's going to get shoehorned in and so that's the only yeah. desire is to just have them put a little thought in the forefront because that the post office isn't going to notify them until they start putting mailboxes in and then they're going to come over and say you can't do this well that and, and i guess you know as i'm sitting here thinking about it when you said you know location i, I think we do we look at safety issues all the time, and I think I don't think we go. You, know, you would want to put your cluster of mailboxes right at the front entrance to your neighborhood, where people are going to stop the time they turn in. Um, so I think finding that suitable location may be something we need to look at. So I, I again, I, I don't know if I have a big problem with it. What we do is we scatter them throughout the neighborhood, so it creates a walkability. Mm -hmm. So you actually can really use the sidewalk to walk to your mailbox. Yep. Um, it does create uh, an opportunity for neighbors to meet neighbors. I was against it at first from the development side, but at the end of the day, it cleans up the sides of the street. You don't have the collapse feeling with the mailboxes on the side of the street. It does look, as Brett said, it does provide a better looking community in the long run. One less thing for my teenage driver to run over. Is this what? <laughs> <laughs> Except when they run over this one, you're yeah. going to be in trouble. You run over this one. This one is a drill. So, all right. So, do we have a, a okay. motion on a recommendation um, to to counsel on the ordinance amendment uh, as as presented by John? And let me clear up one other thing. We do have to meet with the postal community 
when we're planning these things for addressing purposes? Because there, each box is assigned to a certain lot. So, but as, as they said, it does help the builder or the developer that only builds one every so many years. Hey, you've got to meet this requirement. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. <laughs> motion to approve the and add the uh, amendment. Recommendation. Recommendation to add the amendment. So, all right. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. That is unanimous. All right. Uh, and that is our last business item. Um, is there anything else uh, for the good of the commission? Britt? Mr. Chairman, um, obviously Thanksgiving is upon us and we'd like to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. The uh, town hall will be closed tomorrow and Friday. And before we meet again, we will have the town snowball festival. Um, that'll start on December 1st with a concert and carnival in Lexington Square Park that starts at six o'clock and concludes at eight o'clock with the tree lighting. Um, on Saturday, we'll show some movies in the park, um, one of which was already mentioned earlier today. That'll start at 5 o'clock and run to 9. It's going to be Frosty's Winter Wonderland, followed by It's a Wonderful Life. And then the Christmas Parade will start on Sunday, December 3rd at 3.30. So I encourage everybody to take advantage of all the Christmas activities we have early in December. And I um, wish you guys a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, too. All right. Anything else for the good of the commission? <coughs> uh, training December the sixth. Oh, I'm glad you reminded us of that. Yes. That's on my training. Got it. December sixth. <laughs> and it promises to be a, a riveting evening, so <coughs> I understand. It's gonna be a little bad. <laughs> I think it'll be fine. All right. Um, no further business. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I should adjourn. A second. second. All right. All in favor, please raise your right hand. And we are adjourned. And thank you very much for watching the Town Election and Planning Commission in action. Uh, this was our normal monthly meeting held at 8 a.m. November 22nd, 2017. Uh, a recording will air several times throughout the week. On behalf of the commission and the town, I wish you a good day.